So I fought so hard, the employees wanna find me And then wanna hire me What's 100k to a guy like me? Could you please remind me? Fought so hard, this ain't easy Working late nights, you best believe me My grades can only go ace Never wanna see another B unless I'm Jay-Z What's good, fam? It's your host, Jim Pruitt, a.k.a. Form Dean of ED, and I'm bringing you another episode of the Form So Hard podcast. Today, I have a special surprise episode. I wasn't going to record this one, but with everything popping off on Twitter, I had to. Today, guys, we're going to talk about whether or not Seth Denier is trash for UTI. I looked into this a little bit more, and I think there's something we should talk about. So I'm super excited to talk about this episode today. But before I jump into this, I want to make sure I highlight a little news for us. Number one, of course, bolt certifications is right around the corner again. And everyone's going to be getting ready to take those things. We just went through the biggest overhaul of our question bank at PacU Prep. And it's going to be phenomenal. Three pharmacists plus a little AI. Everything completely revamped. All thousand questions redone, looked at by tons of people. It's going to be great. Check that out. We have question banks available for our BCEMP, BCPS, and BCCCP. And we got some biostat stuff for you as well. Number two, home study project for the Empower RX conference is going to be available for you guys coming up pretty soon. Should be available the week of uh, June 12th. So go ahead and go to EmpireRx slash conference dot com. If you have already signed up for live and couldn't make it, this is a good time for you just to go back and get access to that home study project for no calls for you can get your CE. And if you didn't get to experience the greatness, like one of the coolest things I've ever been part of in my life, if you haven't been able to experience that, you got to go check that out. So the home study project is going to be available for you guys, the recordings, the slides, Everything's available for you guys right on that website. So definitely go ahead and check that out. So the big question is Seth Denier, OmniSelf, trash for UTI. I hear many people are using it. I hear some people say that you should not use it. It's not even discussion that we should even be having right now. Seth Denier is trash. And honestly, guys, I always thought so as well due to the low urine concentrations and Seth and there wouldn't be an effective choice for UTI. There's so many other things we can use. There's so many other options. But again, I did some culture callback stuff. And depending on the type of bug and the patient, maybe, you know, Keflex wasn't a thing. Maybe I tried to call in your favorite Seth Paroxine, Seth Paroxine, and a pharmacy didn't have it. So now what am I left with? I'm left with something like OmniSelf. Or what happens if the patient doesn't? want to take a capsule or tablet and they only want something that's going to be a solution and, and the insurance is going to pay for it. That's where I'm like, hmm, this is pretty interesting. And I didn't think it was a big deal until I asked all the ID people and they said, Jimmy, please don't use it. It is horrible. Uh, but after doing some researching and engaging in some discussions on Twitter, I'm actually a little bit more intrigued. I found that this topic is quite controversial. So let's go ahead and jump a little bit more into it. So a little background on Cephalidir. It's going to be a third generation oral cephalosporin antibiotic. It's commonly used to treat a variety of different bacterial infections, usually upper respiratory tract infections and things like that for pediatrics. Uh, now, when it comes to UTIs, antibiotics are going to be first choice of defense. And traditionally, we're going to be using things like a nitroferentoin, uh, cephalexin or Keflex, and we've been getting away from things like Batram and fluoroquinolone. So now the 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 use of cephalosporins has become a lot more prevalent, and I think it's something that's actually a little bit more intriguing that we can use. But the choice of antibiotic can vary depending on the specific bacteria causing infection, patient's health condition, the antibiotic's ability to reach the site of infection. So today we're going to really dive down and focus on Ceftonir and its role in treating UTIs. So the controversy. Uh, I didn't think this was anything surrounding it until I got into a heated debate with someone who said, it's not even a question that no one should ever use it and you're not even being evidence based if you're ever prescribing or recommending or even allowing someone to use Ceftonir for a urinary tract infection then I thought to myself am I being a lexicon pharmacist am I being someone who just 
goes along willy nilly and say, hey, well, I've been using something here and it's, it's fine. I haven't looked into this much and I want to figure out, was there any any meat behind this? I want to figure out what was going on. So it seems like the controversy surrounding Sefton stems again from the fact that it has some low low concentrations in the urine, particularly compared to some of the other agents that's being used. And that's traditionally where it stopped for me. Um, some argue that this makes it less effective in treating a UTI. And realistically, I can see that being the case. If it doesn't really get there, it's not a lot of drug there. Uh, it's it's going to be trash. However, others point out and I've been in a situation where I made the same recommendation to some of my providers and they point out that Cephalin actually has proven clinical efficacy and safety in treating UTIs. And I was like, well, there has to be a study out there that shows that Cephalin is horrible. And I put it out there on Twitter. I asked all the ID people, I asked everyone who who's a lot smarter than me to show me the study that shows that Cephalin actually doesn't lead to better cure rates or mycological cure rates or representations, anything from a clinical standpoint. That's what I was looking for. And what I found was something a little different. All right. So let's go ahead and jump this off. The first study that I looked at, Cardinal and colleagues, it was published in 2023. It was a retrospective single center study that included children from two months, to 18 years old, that was given oral antibiotics for outpatient treatment of confirmed UTIs. The primary outcome is going to be re-encountered with the hospital, emergency department, or urgent care within 30 days, and modification of antibiotic regimen within 14 days. They also looked at the development of C. difficile infection or new allergic reactions to an antibiotic prescribed. And what they found was that there were, the rates of re-encounter were similar regardless of the initial antibiotic and patients who received ceftonir had a lower rate of medication changes. And again, this was between ceftonir, cephalexin, and cephalomethoxazole trimethoprim. And they didn't show any difference in side effect profile amongst these agents. So it was one of these first studies that looked at this. And we know that ceftonir is just more commonly used within pediatric population. And I thought it was a good study to get to start us off with. All right. Then there was another study done by Davis and colleagues. Shout out to the pharmacists out there doing this study. And this study found that despite high resistance to rates to some antibiotics in the U.S. Mexican border, Cephalin, along with augmentin, cefiroxine, and trifurantoin, actually showed lower resistance rates and definitely could be effective uh, for UTI treatment. And this was compared to uh, cephalexin, Bactrim, and fluoroquinolone. So it just really shows that again, when looking at some of these other agents, our resistance rates may be changing quite a bit. And Cephalin again does show to be uh, something potential option for this. Again, it's not trash, at least in these studies so far. In 2005, Sattler and colleagues, high activity against common UTI pathogens and more potent than cefiroxime and cefrozil. Uh, the study analyzed the susceptibilities of common UTI pathogens to various antibiotics and found that ceftonir was actually more potent against these pathogens. But again, this was about 20 years ago. Um, Looking at this another study by Bunsu and colleagues, they found that high susceptibility of urinary pathogens to ceftonir, which was comparable or superior to other antibiotics. And this study found that urinary pathogens were highly susceptible to ceftonir, making it a viable option for treating UTIs. I said, okay, well, that's for treating it. I know sometimes we have people that actually get prophylactic antibiotics. And Oshi and colleagues in 2011 looked at this as well. They found that prophylactic ceftonir could prevent recurrent and complicated UTIs in the pediatric population. And the study found that, again, ceftonir could be used prophylactically to prevent recurrent UTIs in children, providing a new potential use of this antibiotic. So not only has it been shown in adults, it's also been shown in pediatrics. Not only has it been shown in uncomplicated, it's also been shown in complicated as well. Lee and colleagues in 2000 uh, actually found clinical cure rates and microbiological response rates for ceftonir and cefachlor was statistically equivalent. And the study compared these two uh, and, to, and found uh, to other antibiotics and found that both had similar cure rates and microbiological microbiological response rates. So we're starting to talk about some of these other oral cephalosporins that are a little bit more narrow that concentrate a little better. And it didn't really show any difference in this study. Another thing that came out, I wanted to make sure I wasn't even losing my mind with the low urine concentration rates, 
Chemical colleagues in 2014 looked at this and they found that ceftonir has low urine concentrations, which could potentially affect its efficacy in treating UTIs. And this is what kind of raised again concerns about ceftonir that suggests that it could potentially affect its efficacy. But as we saw across the board, this did not happen. There's about three or more studies that I, I could look at. Long story short, when looking at ceftonir for treating adult, pediatric, complicated, and uncomplicated, it found that it was just as effective as all the others. Now, that brings one component, but what I did not see was one study that showed that compared to other cephalosporins, those same cephalosporins that are actually shown to be in the guidelines right beside ceftonir, it never showed that it was worse than those. A few of them, again, showed that it was completely better than, than, than Bactrim and fluoroquinolones for uncomplicated. So I was intrigued by that. I couldn't find one study. And when I put it out there to other people, I did not find one clinical study that found that ceftonir was trash. So this got me really thinking about all of this. And I thought it was, was cool, but a few things I want to kind of caveat off this by. And I think this is something that I've learned within the last few years. Again, despite its low urine concentrations, there's actually studies looking at the fact that it still is high enough to kill E. coli and most of the common urinary pathogens that's going to be out there. So again, low concentrations does not mean no concentrations. And the context of the fact of treating these infections, they're not a really big difference. So clinically, nothing. So from a Lexicomp standpoint, from a PK standpoint, yeah, it's not as attractive as some of the others. But when we actually take the medication, there's not much of a difference that we're seeing, at least from these studies and at least from all the information that I found. There's a few people, Ron Feldman out there has a data set he's going to publish on this. There's uh, so a few other people that's been looking at this and they're saying that there's really no major, major difference. So again, it could be a viable option for treating or even preventing some UTIs, particularly looking at the pediatric population. But one thing that we have to consider that, and someone brought up a phenomenal point, guys, Cephazolin is used as the susceptibility surrogate for all oral cephalosporins, including ceftonir for uncomplicated UTIs, not ceftriaxone. So what happens is I think some people get some beef with ceftonir because someone's going to say, oh, this is basically PO ceftriaxone. This is PO ceftonir. It is not necessarily that. And when we're looking at our susceptibilities, it is not that. This is a crucial point that many clinicians may not be aware of. And I know a lot of people out there based on that Twitter thread, they were not aware of this. So keep that in mind. Again, cephazolin and ceph, when you when you pull up your urine culture, that's going to be what you're looking at. Again, at least that's what I thought. So when I looked at the fact that, OK, I just learned that NSF or cephazolin or Cephazolin, whatever you want to call it, is the surrogate for ceftonir. And I want to say, like, when did that come up? And the ID people came and told me, that, you know, the really smart people did this. But I came across an interesting report from the FDA about the use of cefazolin as a marker for oral cephalosporins. And according to the FDA, they said that there is insufficient data at this time to support this proposed cefazolin susceptibility MIC breakpoint of less than or equal to 16 milligrams per liter as a surrogate for determining breakpoints for oral cephalosporins for the treatment of uncomplicated UTIs due to E. coli, Klebsiella, and Proteus, again, the major common ones. Therefore, no changes are recommended on the FDA STIC website. I thought that was pretty interesting. And again, I'm going to continue to practice the way that it is, but I, I thought that that was pretty intriguing that we're basing a lot of this on the fact that OK, we need to use cefazolin as our as our surrogate marker, but necessary. That's not me. That's not as strong. And not everyone's going to have the availability for their micro lab to break down uh, to see whether an agent is going to be susceptible to ceftonir or some of the other oral cephalosporins. born. So this just makes it so much more complicated. This just makes it so much more intriguing and really get us to the fact that we may not know as much as we actually think we do about this topic. And it's something that. I really want people to, again, look at their data sets, 
look and see if you have patients that have been treating with this and look and see if there a clinical difference in the treatment of UTIs, depending if you're going to give them something like Keflex versus you giving them something like Seftonir. There's a host of other reasons, however, that we probably shouldn't use Seftonir up front. The got ones that don't recommend it. We don't necessarily know if we're going to be giving somebody such a broad agent and inducing resistance. But again, for those patients that you do feel are great candidates for this, again, depending on if they need something liquid, depending on if they don't have the retail pharmacies, don't have Cefproxime, Cefroxime, you know, Cefprozo, all these other cool second generation cephalosporins, then Cefthinner may be something you can use. I think it's intriguing. I'm going to continue to use it for the patients that I think going to be a major benefit. And I just want to kind of wrap all this up by saying the use of Zephyr for UTI is complex and pretty controversial. Despite its low urine concentration, Zephyr actually has shown over and over again, actually, efficacy in treating UTIs. Again, with the FDA position on the use of uh, Zephyr as a surrogate marker for determining breakpoints for oral cephalosporins for the treatment of uncomplicated UCIs adds another layer to the discussion. Uh, we can probably go deeper into that, but I'm not an ID specialist. I'm not an expert at this. This is something that I'm going to continue to look at, but I think it's very intriguing. And what I do hope though, is that this episode kind of makes you think about things a little differently. And I went into this thinking that this may be something completely different than I actually found. Uh, but it just shows that, again, we can't just rely on pharmacokinetic data to weigh our decisions. And especially when we're bringing this information to our colleagues that are physicians and nurses, especially we want to change protocols. We need to make sure we have the data sound in this. And I'm pretty sure that someone can find something else that may oppose this. I would love to learn it. Please send it my way. Tag me on Twitter at PharmD underscore in the ED. And I would love to read it and redo this episode if I have to. But right now, I'm not putting Sefton in the trash. I think it's actually useful. I think that the data, if you bring evidence based, shows that Sefton can be a, a phenomenal agent for the right patient. So I'm going to close out with that, guys. Again, leaving you guys with, again, another Big push for shout out to all of the people who went to Empower RX last month. Shout out to my committee, Megan Rack, Kyle DeWitt, John Packer, Chantrell Johnson, Lance Ray. They, they did a phenomenal job. We're going to make it bigger and better next year. Please believe that. And if you guys are getting ready to start prepping for board certification, we got you guys at Pack You Prep. Again, we have that over in the, in the show notes and all of the stuff that I've been talking about today, all of the studies, I'm going to have that in the show notes as well for you can drive down this, this, this valley of knowledge and just searching yourself. I thought it was pretty cool. So again, I'm going to close out with that and I'm going to close out the same way I always do guys. You don't have to be a pharmacist. You don't work in the ED, but everything you do, make sure you farm so hard. Closes it. Ozzy scratches his head. Whatever she's looking for, it isn't in there. Perfect, perfect, perfect.